thank you very much for everybody for joining us. Uh, this is our, I think, Thursday session of um, Knowledge Drops, essentially as part of this Ethereal Hackathon. Today I have Amelia Altevena and Zach Herring from the, um, the labs design team over at Consensus. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, tell us where you came from? Sure. Uh, so I am, as Brian said, Amelia Altevena. Um, I currently reside in Denver, Colorado. Uh, my background, I started design as an industrial designer. So, you know, spoilers, this is about prototyping, uh, lots, of prototy lots of physical prototyping in industrial design. Um, and then I did exhibit design for about five years, and then I've been in UX design for uh, six or seven years. The math is hard. Um, but yeah, agency work, currently at Consensus, uh, UX is awesome. Great. Zach, the, uh, the older I get, the harder the, the, the math it gets. Seriously. <laughs> Keep it map free, Zach, as you um, bring us into your background. I will. Um, so I'm Zach. I, uh, I have been a designer for a, a certain amount of time that I'm not really sure. If you look at my LinkedIn, you could probably add up the years. Um, I started out actually as a commercial designer who then, because there was no like commercial work and ended up having to uh, program websites uh, for, the, for the agency I started out with, did some uh, freelance design for about four or five years, moved to Colorado, got involved with the tech scene, I've been bouncing around um, doing basically like product design for everything from like really small startups to uh, Dell EMC was like one of the big, the bigger places I've been at, um, running like a couple of products for them and then uh, working on our kind of our bootstrap, uh, bootstrap sort of angular service as well. Um, and then, yeah, I uh, have been consulting for the last three-ish years, uh, working with a whole bunch of companies uh, at the same company as Amelia. We've actually worked working in the company before that, uh, and then have been consulting a whole bunch of companies uh, at Consensus as well. Great. Thank you very much. And as, as Amelia said, we are going to talk about prototyping today. Um, we're in the midst of a hackathon. There's a lot of teams right now thinking about uh, sort of just what to build. Uh, eventually, we think prototypes will play a role in their process in terms of how they get to the other end of this. Let's start with what is a prototype, Amelia, and what is prototyping for? Sure. Uh, basically, prototyping is making to learn. Um, so you're not making like the final pro, like this is the perfect thing. Um, prototyping is really a thing that you make to put your idea or a lot of cases an, an assumption, and I'm sure we'll get into this, uh, out into the world to test. Um, sometimes you could be testing a bunch of different things. Sometimes you're testing just one thing. Um, but yeah, it's really something that you're making in order to learn about the thing that you're making and then hopefully make adjustments. Um, and yeah, exactly. I, I would, I would add, right. Like that we, the way that we think of a lot of times, whenever you're talking to technical people, whenever you think of prototyping, you're thinking like, well, I'm just going to code it, but it's not going to scale or there's not going to be tests written to it or something like that. Um, and I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, because essentially what you're trying to do, that's more product typing than it is prototyping. Like you're building like a miniaturized small version of that, of that thing. Whereas like prototyping to me is, is almost like a, it works to me. Prototyping is like building like the stand up pretend Western village instead of building the actual like town or the city, right? Like you're just building the storefronts so that if you're standing in front of it, it looks like it's an actual city. That's great. Uh, like so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so in, in both of those, it's a matter of testing something. Uh, why, why would you do a prototype instead of a product type, Zach, to, to borrow from your phrase? Yeah. Um, I mean, because it just takes too, too long, right? Like uh, a lot of times, whatever you're thinking, of, I mean, it takes too long and also you're making a ton of assumptions and to back to Amelia's point, right? Like you make to learn. Um, you can learn a whole bunch from prototyping. I think that's one of the, like, the best things about it is that you can put it in front of people. Uh, you can find out what their appetite is, not just necessarily for the product itself, but understand like what specifics around the product, like what their appetite is as far as the floors of value delivery, et cetera. Um, it's a lot faster to build something that is uh, essentially smoke and mirrors um, before investing a ton of time into it. Um, if you haven't read uh, Google Sprint, I think it's a fantastic introduction to this sort of this sort of process, this sort of idea. Um, and essentially, I think one of, the best, one of the best examples of this is they were working with a company that was trying to determine whether or not a robot concierge 
uh, would even be worthwhile to develop. Like people are even interested in it. Um, if they're going to actually build a product, we are talking about six to 12 months worth of delivery. Uh, instead, they were able to sit down over a week, uh, figure out what they're actually trying to test, hack something together over two to three days, and then validate that that was actually something that people wanted. Um, and I think there's a lot of overlap, especially blockchain, right? Um, the time to develop in blockchain, I think, is averaging at about like two to three X longer than traditional web two, just because so, so, so much of the tools still need to be built, so much of the infrastructure still needs to be built out. Um, that prototyping, in my opinion, in web three space is that much more important because it saves you that much more time, especially if you're dealing with, with the amount of time that you have to, to, uh, to build things, so. Heck yeah. So this is this is uh, kind of exactly what you're talking about, Zach. I just I just wanted to pull this up really quickly because it's one of my favorite uh, charts. Yeah. Um, where the fidelity and the quantity of your prototype should be a lot at the beginning, and then you slowly refine them towards the end, where, rather than just building the thing at the very beginning, because there's still so much to explore uh, at the beginning of a product cycle. Um, you don't want to just go all the way down here. Uh, then. Yeah, then you have problems. <laughs> That's great. We'll th we'll, sh we'll throw this, some sprint materials from uh, the sprint book in the in the show notes, and we'll also throw this chart. I, I think this would be great. Um, I, I love that we we're both so visual that we couldn't resist, but like show things while we talk about them. Yeah, you guys were finger painters for sure. I can uh, and I can stop sharing when when you want. Um, we can leave this up the rest of the show. It feels good. Now feel free to take it down. I think our faces will be a little bit more um, empathetic. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. If I can figure oh, out how to do that. Great. So, uh, so prototyping is about testing assumptions to de-risk the amount of energy and time you put in um, on things that you don't know if they're the right things. Uh, so, so step into the shoes of uh, the people we have right now as part of this hackathon. Um, you've got a team together. You've got a challenge. You're kind of wrapping yourselves around. Um, you're beginning to think of ideas that you that might be the thing you want to spend a lot more energy in the rest of the time. Uh, what? Uh, a building, what's the, what's the first things they should be looking for um, if they're looking to de-risk that time and find something that they can get some feedback on? Yeah, so I said this kind of at the top of the, top of the conversation, but the, one of the big things that, especially early on, that you want to test is whatever the biggest assumption that you're making is. Um, and sometimes this is really, really, really clear. You know, sometimes, like, you know, we like to use Uber a lot as an example. Um, you know, one of their biggest assumptions was like, will strangers get in the car with other strangers, you know, using their phones? Um, you know, and for that, you don't necessarily need to test that with uh, a fully built out app and a car that has Starburst in it and waka waka waka. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I would, I would encourage these teams to really think hard about what their biggest assumption is. Um, what is the thing that they're, that they're assuming uh, is true? Um, for their prototype or for their, uh, for their product to work. There's a, I would, I would even add to that. Like it might even be useful as the team to just get together and say like, what needs to be true in order for the thing that we're building to be like successful, right? Like, and what, if it's false, are we dead in the water? Right? Like, so if people like in, in the Uber case, if people were not willing to get into strangers cars, Uber wouldn't have worked. And so they needed to test that out and make sure make sure that that was something that people were actually like interested in doing or willing to willing to do before they even put time into building out the infrastructure for that. And uh, Zach is definitely super sick of this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, there, one of my favorite prototyping examples uh, was actually it's called Free Water for Boston, um, and it was a bank team. It was a team of designers, and they were testing out the idea of a mobile ATM. Um, so the idea of like if you had an app on your phone and you were like, hey, maybe the ATM will come to me, um, like, is that an actual good idea? Is that something that we can like do as this, this large bank? Um, so they could have spent, you know, millions of dollars making a mobile roaming ATM. Um, but instead the designer said, okay, what is the biggest thing that we're assuming? And it's that uh, the logistics of driving um, a commodity such as money <laughs> around the streets of Boston, like you could actually do it in a way that would be efficient and that it would work for the users. Um, so really their biggest assumption was just that the logistics would work. Uh, so what they did was they built a website, freewaterforboston.com. They took out some like cheap internet ads. Uh, they confused a lot of people in Boston um, who were just like, what? Free water? Why? 
Um, <laughs> they hired uh, they hired some college kids with some vans, and basically you went to this website and you just said, hey, bring me free water. Um, so they tested, you know, for a weekend, driving these vans around and giving people free bottles of water. Uh, and they realized through this testing that uh, driving around Boston is a total nightmare and parking in Boston is a total nightmare. Um, so those logistics themselves, the biggest assumption didn't work. Um, and they didn't have to build like, you know, a $2 million uh, mobile roaming ATM to figure this out. That's great. Um, and what I love about that too, is it's not, it's not a, um, you're not a, you're not testing the assumption of the insight. You're testing the assumption of the capability, um, which is the ability to execute on the insight, I guess. Zach, could you maybe give an example that's more tied to a software assumption, something that where, where the logistics or uh, sort of physical constraints wouldn't be part of it? Uh, I mean, just for prototyping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm sure, anyone who's built software is familiar with wireframes, right? Like wireframes or even a, even like a, uh, something that's even a little bit closer to reality. Um, those to me are, are really useful as far as, you know, testing out flows, te testing out interest. Um, one of the things that I'd say that we've done recently with, um, web three companies, especially is it's really important to get all the steps involved, right? Like, especially if you're talking about, I mean, we're talking about DeFi right now, right? Like, so there are a lot of steps you're talking about, um, multiple like you know on ramps off ramps you've got to switch from eth to uh, uh weth to die etc to just get some of these different instruments kind of working um and so i think one of the things that you can that's really helpful whenever you're testing out these prototypes uh, is to even just track like it would be like the number of steps and are they proportion uh proportionate to like the actual value that you're delivering to the customer is really useful on that um yeah, to me, like to me, like those are those are kind of like some useful some useful ways to prototype, um, and then obviously like testing demand for Web three stuff. Like there's actually a lot of stuff from Web two that, that ends up sort of there being a lot of correlation. So if you wanted to test like the interest in like an actual product or a, an idea, we've actually done um, at the last agency I was at, uh, we were we were working through some ideas around like. Um, essentially like some ideas around like how do we how do we appeal to an older audience like how do we connect people like which of these mentor ideas is a good idea uh, and what we ended up doing was just like creating some Facebook ads um, and basically doing like an ABC test between like the bill a bought a campaign on Facebook track to see how many people sign up for the beta uh, or click through and then um, use that one to kind of validate that this was the one that we were actually going to go to I feel like Basically, the more vague an idea is, the more you can kind of test the concepts with different things like I mean, even just blog posts, ad campaigns, um, et cetera. And then like the more concrete the idea gets, the more uh, closer to simulating the actual experience the prototype needs to be. So like wireframes, um, even like some actual click throughs and, and motion prototyping, that sort of thing. That's great. Um, Amelia, do you have any other sort of insights on what you should be testing for, figuring that out early? You mean in terms of like the assumptions or yeah. 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 I, I imagine, I imagine a lot of, um, th there's things people want to build right now. Uh, and we just talked about testing demand. There are a couple ways to test for demand. What are some other early assumptions that might be worth kind of stepping into before you really start digging down as a team? Yeah. I mean like one of the biggest ones. So if you looked at that chart that I was just sharing, like one of the access or the, the, uh, I always get my X and Y. The Y axis, the Y axis was uh, desirability. So I think that that's you know when you're thinking about early on, I think desirability is a pretty big thing that you want to test for early on. So you know you're really looking for like, is this something that people want and need, and does it solve a problem? Um, so that's kind of a really big one uh, initially. Um, so I think you know going back to in terms of getting into the the weeds of the prototyping, you know, everything in the kitchen sink, um, really exploring desirability of an idea. You can really have, you know, the, what we call the minimum desirable product. So, you know, another really great analogy that I like to think about is the cupcake and the wedding cake. Um, so when, if, if a wedding cake uh, needed to be prototyped, you wouldn't just make a wedding cake, um, but you also wouldn't like deliver, say, just the frosting. Because uh, that wouldn't actually be desirable. Um, so when you're thinking about making a prototype, don't think about it in the oh maybe I should just uh, maybe I should just make the onboarding because that's going to be the biggest you know kind of hang up. 
you might want to deliver the entire wedding, or sorry, not the entire wedding cake. <laughs> you might want to deliver um, something closer to a cupcake that still uh, is desirable in terms of an experience um, so that you can test the actual kind of, so you can start testing things like the flow, um, you know, is this something that people want and, you know, kind of refine from there. That's great. And, I think that, and Zach has a really great, I don't know if you have it with you, but there's a really great uh, uh, chart that is the, the skateboard and the scooter and the car. And I think that also illustrates desirability quite well. That's, is that the, that's the Spotify chart? The Spotify product chart? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Very cool. Um, so you start with desirability. Uh, so that's the question of, should I make this? Um, should exactly. I make, should, does, is anybody asking me to make this? And then you move into something more like feasibility. Can I make this? Um, yeah. And is the thing I'm making moving in the right direction to solve the problem? Um, it, in terms of being people who are going to be looking at some of these hackathon um, projects and, and the teams, what they come back with, Zach, what would you really like to see um, in terms of hearing about the process teams go through to get really good signals so that they, they come out the other side with something that feels validated? Uh, I mean, honestly, if I could, I, to me, the thing that I'm always looking for whenever I'm prototyping out ideas and protect, potential products is I'm looking for at the end of the, uh, the session, at the end of the test, them asking me, can this be ready tomorrow? Right. Like that's what I'm all, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So honestly, like, and we, like I was, I was, uh, I was kind of talking through this whole idea uh, with a, with a buddy of mine. I, wouldn't it be cool if at the end of these, at the end of these tests, like you could get, you could record the video and your users actually provide like the, the pitch for you. Like they say, like, I want that, like, I want this, this is something that I need. This would fix so many of my, so many pain points that I've got in my day to day. Like to me, like, this isn't just necessarily, I think too often we look at like user testing as like a, a, a checkbox, right? Like a checkbox to, to, to hit to make sure that we're not building crap. I think what you need to actually look at this, uh, look at this for this and especially user research, the stuff that comes before this, is that these are delivering for you the insights that you need to build a product that is better than everybody else's, right? Like you're using these prototypes to find out how people actually think, feel, behave, Etc. And so these are kind of like part of your core value prop moving forward. So that's kind of what I would hope people would get out of this, right? Is that like the more that they test these things, the more that they use these things, the more data that you're going to have, the more people that you're going to have looking into the camera of Zoom or what, or even in real life and saying like, "Holy cow, this is amazing! I cannot wait for this to be real. Please make this real." Like that's what that's essentially what you're looking for. You're looking for people to look at you and say, "Please make this real." That's great. I think I the only thing that I would add to that is that, you know, I, I would encourage people not to think of these as very precious objects. You know, a lot of times in, uh, in prototyping, especially in UX prototyping, we do paper prototypes and we draw all over them and then we throw them away and we hopefully take photos. <laughs> um, but yeah, that I would also hope that not only do you get those, uh, you know, those users saying, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, but if I were, if I were judging this hackathon and thinking about what, what people are coming away with, I would also say like, we learned X from this prototype. Uh, so we're going to change, we're going to change this because, you know, we learned, you know, da, 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 da. Right. Um, so actually, you know, acknowledging real changes that you're going to make based on things that you learn. Uh, I think, I think that that, that is, that would be awesome. I want to, I just want to plus one that, right? I think too often we make things, and I think that's one of the dangers of coding or too early is because we make things because it's such an intense sort of act of creation. That's sort of something we feel like almost like that's our, like that we feel like an ownership to it, right? Like that's, we've invested ourselves into it. And I would encourage you not to make the same mistake with prototyping. These things need, these are, these are made to be thrown away. I tell people as early in the prototyping sub process as possible. I say, I design and show as early as possible to be wrong early. Like I want to be wrong early. I know I'm going to be wrong. I would rather get that out of the way this, that this part than as opposed to later. So that's that's what I was strongly encouraged to. So so you're a you're a team here. You've got a big idea in your head. You're very in love with your idea. Um, how do you talk yourself into uh, being able to say this idea may need to change a lot depending on the contact I get with uh, real people. Did you rephrase that? 
Yeah, I, I can probably pull it into your 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 working life. Um, as consultants with with both startups here at Consensus and uh, previously, um, I I know we've all been in this situation where you you come in and you say let's let's get the opinion of people who are actually using your product and, and use how, use how they use it to tell us to inform us what we should do next. Um, but the big idea, uh, people people holding their ideas pretty precious and their products pretty precious. Um, what do you do to coach people over that, that kind of barrier of saying, we should actually listen to what our users are doing? I think Amelia is smiling knowingly. You know, just really, uh, really put your fist down and say, we need to pivot. <laughs> no, not you, necessarily. I usually say, would you rather be right or rich? Mm. Ooh, I like that. I, that yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's good. Um, but yeah, you can't, you definitely can't be super precious with your ideas early on. Um, and you definitely like, your ideas as much as your prototypes, uh, you do have to listen to what the people are saying. Um, and that's why so many really awesome companies, uh, you know, a lot of the really, really successful startups that we, you know, all know and love today as giant companies, um, many of them didn't start out doing what they originally intended to do. Um, I think there's I mean, like, I think Amazon is one of those companies, like there's a, like every other company that you look at, uh, they started out doing something and now they're doing something completely different. Um, and hopefully they're doing it well. Uh, and I'm sure you guys can think of a thousand examples of that. Zach's nodding his head. <laughs> cool. Okay, this is great. It sounds like what we've gotten to so far is prototypes, uh, they reduce risk for things you can do early so you don't waste time on, 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 um, doing the wrong things. Um, there's an early stage, which is about testing for desirability. Are there people who need this thing? There's a later stage that's about testing for feasibility, which means can I do this thing to, to execute on the promise of the um, sort of desired thing? Uh, and then there's a big question you wanna to get to at the end is uh, somebody saying, can this be ready tomorrow? Once you've kind of tested these assumptions and figured out what bets are the right bets um, for you guys to take. How often are you prototyping uh, in the life cycle of a product? all the time. <laughs> um, you know, it, I think someone asked me recently, like, when, when does the design process end? And I jokingly said, never. Um, that's not true. Uh, well, maybe it kind of is true. <laughs> um, lifelong learning, you know, that whole thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's, in terms of prototyping, it is something that really does need to sort of inhabit really the full life cycle of the product that you're creating. Um, you know, it's, in terms of getting to perfect, you know, a lot of people like to say, well, you're never really going to get to perfect. And there's always going to be, you know, there's always going to be outside change. Even if your product lives for five years and it's really, really good, for example, Spotify, um, like there, there's still a huge design team that are continuously adding things that make the experience uh, more and more just freaking awesome. Um, so in terms of designing and prototyping, you know, like we joke, but really it never ends. Um, I think that there is a, and in, also in terms of the life cycle of the product, you know, you don't want to jump into prototyping at the very beginning. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can learn from just talking to people and doing your due diligence and doing research uh, up front, um, doing a lot of that, and then actually, you know, using that to inform the prototyping. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, don't start with prototyping. Uh, learn a bunch of stuff first. Um, try to make a hypothesis and then prototype. So yeah, don't don't prototype at the very beginning. <laughs> so, so open up a lot of questions at the beginning and prototype uh, hypothetical answers, hypotheses um, around what could answer those questions. That's exactly. great, Zach. Zach, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I I think she got it. I mean, I would just say, I mean. If your product is changing and you want to de-risk the change, then you should be prototyping all of those changes to test those out. Great. So I'd like to spend this last little section talking specifically about Web3 and blockchain, um, because I know, uh, Zach, you alluded to it earlier, there tends to be a longer development cycle um, in Web3 because there are still a series of things kind of in various um, phases of maturity. I know you two, along with our colleague Katie, uh, spent a lot of time doing prototype and uh, sort of design strategies and design thinking sessions with Web3 blockchain-based companies. What are the kinds of assumptions that need to be tested in Web3 that you guys have found to be kind of unique or distinctive to this space? I mean, my answer is, oh, what were you saying? 
I was just well, going to say, my say work. Is it, it's probably the same as my answer. <laughs> you, you go then. One, two, three, onboarding. Yeah, onboarding. Um, yes. <laughs> And I would say, and I would just say human behavior in general, right? Like to me, web three is especially because you have like, you have this idea, this concept of smart money and this idea that you're not just designing products, you're designing economies that people have make a lot of, I feel like we make a, a lot of assumptions that we could accurately test out um, using just and games, using games, using like uh, analogies, et cetera. Um, we make a lot of assumptions as far as like what people will value and how they will value it and how they will interact with that value, et cetera. And a lot of it, I think, relies on this idea of like the rational, kind of like the the, uh, the rational investor sort of thing. Um, and I think it's, you know, like you, to me, like that's why I'm really, I'm not sick of that story, the, uh, uh, the ATM, the roving ATM story, because I think especially in Web3, it has so much value in getting people to think across different industries and think like, I, what am I trying to prove? Like, I know that I'm building something for DeFi. I know I'm trying to build something for like, uh, you know, like to predict beha human behavior based off of past uh, credit or whatever. I'm trying to analyze risk. To me, like what better way to really nail down that risk al algorithm than putting a, a game together and testing it on that, right? Like and making sure that that, like that's basically like the, the tighter, the uh, tighter the iterative, the iterative loops where you can get those feedback as far as validating what people are interested in, uh, the more accurate design, your designs and your product are gonna be. And I'll be a little controversial and say that I think the space, or at least the, the startups in the space, there's a lot of assumption that you need to start building on chain and everything must be blockchain and, you know, sacrilege to not design and prototype you know, on chain. Um, one of one of my favorite companies that we've worked with here at Consensus, uh, you know, the founder who we actually met with today, you know, I think he said something along the lines of like, this, this solution that we're coming up with, it is, it could be a really awesome blockchain solution, but the prototype that we're testing and that we're releasing into the world, it doesn't need to be on chain for it to work and it to have value. And I think that that's something that founders really need to think about when they're thinking about you know, not only prototyping, but like what they're actually making and putting out into the world. Um, blockchain is an amazing technology, but, you know, if your solution, if you can get to that cupcake uh, and kind of lower that time spent um, by releasing potentially a Web2 solution at the beginning, and then recognizing that blockchain is something that's going to really add to the impact of the company or the product that you're creating, um, you know, in the middle or towards the end, uh, that's great too. So, yeah, I don't know if that's controversial or not, but <laughs> well, I think it's. I, I'm Just glad you brought it up. Decentralization. Yeah, it's um minimum. Vi Gabriel uses this phrase uh, very often. Uh, minimum viable decentralization. I think you're right. Uh, early on in a, in an ecosystem development phase, everything needs to be on the blockchain um, because the 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 big task of the ecosystem is to develop the blockchain. Uh, now we're actually getting to this place where design thinking can play a much bigger role in validating things for markets, not just for infrastructure, uh, which means we get to test assumptions um, around minimum viable uh, decentralization in order to get to a maximum viable decentralization once we've proven that. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I, I wanna do a quick recap. Uh, please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, prototyping is to de-risk your activities forward um, first, right? Um, De-risk it first before you pour more energy into it. The first big question is, is this desirable? Does somebody want it? Um, that's a good place to start. Do some research and then test an assumption around that. The second one is feasibility. Are there any things that would make this unfeasible, infeasible? Not feasible. Um, can I test the feasibility of it uh, in that way? If you can get over that barrier, the big thing you want to get to is um, something that sounds so great, an assumption that's been tested against a problem um, that's valuable enough for people to say, can this be ready tomorrow? And then when you get to blockchain, ask what is the minimum viable decentralization this can start with or minimum viable blockchain this can start with. Um, I love it. To, to figure out how it works. Is there anything you would like to add in terms of what is one really quick inspirational piece for our hackathon um, players uh, in terms of prototyping early and often in this next 13 days now. I mean, Google Sprint does it in a week. You've got two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'm going to, uh, I'll send a link. Uh, they have a fantastic, there's a fantastic podcast called uh, Startup where they, the entire episode was about 
them using uh, the, the Google Sprint method to prototype out a product and determine whether or not it was worthwhile. So I'll include a link in that. That's great. I think my nugget would be make, make the cupcake, don't make the frosting. <laughs> Wait, are you saying there's no frosting on the cupcake or? Oh, no, there's frosting on the cupcake. Okay, now I hear you. Make the full Actually, cupcake with the frosting. Some of us, well, I guess some of us just like eating frosting. So don't make just the cake part. Make the whole thing. <laughs> don't make the whole thing. Make just the cupcake. <laughs> Love it. I think I'm on board. I'll, I'll see you guys in the kitchen. Um, Amelia, Zach, thank you very much. Hackathoners, uh, see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Bye.